<laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to th start by introducing myself. I'm Wendy Hisco. I'm the library director here at Brown O Library. And I wanted to thank our program sponsors for the night. Um, the Vermont Department of Libraries, National Life Group Foundation, Tapia and Huckabee PC, the Friends of the Brown O Library, the Brown O Library Foundation, and our media partner, RATN, who's here filming tonight. Um, I wanted to remind you all to silence your cell phones so we um, can go on inter uninterrupted. And also let you know that there's a sign-up sheet going around that the Humanities Council uses for um, reporting feedback to their funders. Um, and there is also um, feedback forms if you're interested in filling them out on your way out. Um, first Wednesdays is a program of the Vermont Humanities Council that happens the first Wednesday of every month. Um, it runs from October through May at eight libraries across the state of Vermont, and we're really happy to be a host in this region. I wanted to introduce our speaker here, Jewel Emerson. Um, she is, was an artist in residence, costume designer, and professor at Middlebury College from 1990 to 2014. Prior to coming to Middlebury, Jewel worked professionally as a costume artist for television, film, feature films, commercials, and the professional theater. Her pro professional credits include The Wonder Years, Saturday Night Live, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, The Private Lives for the California Repertory Theater, and The Importance of Being Earnest at the Olney Theater Center which was a 1998 Helen Hayes Award nominee for Outstanding Costume Design. Jewel is a recipient of the J.S. Seedman Award and earned her MFA at NYU's Tisch School of Arts. Please join me in welcoming Jewel. Nice. All right. I hear myself quite well. Um, before we begin, I want to do my disclaimer, which is that I have nothing per pro professionally to do with Downton Abbey. I simply um, received a phone call one day from the Vermont Humanities Council asking me to develop a lecture about Downton Abbey because so many people love it. And, um, and I thought, sure, I love it too. Uh, the difference is it's taken me from just being a happy observer and, you know, oh my god, what will they do to please don't put Anna in prison to um, someone who's going, oh, and it's wearing that for the lineup. OK, what does that mean? So it's, it certainly changed my viewership of it. But I, if anything, appreciate the costumes, the design, the you know, uh, production values more. And, uh, but I did want to say that I'm not in any way pretending that I am the costume designer of that show. Uh, before we begin, what? Absolutely. How's that? I am trying to hold back so nobody loses their eardrums. Uh, before we begin, I did, though, be want to warn any liberals in the, are there any liberals in this audience? <laughs> I, I knew I saw a Bernie Sanders sweatshirt come in here, or a t-shirt or something. Um, because if you are a liberal, it's going to uh, destroy you. So I, I just want you to know right now, you darn well better stop watching that Downton Abbey because Fox News, we know Fox News is a very reputable news source. So if it says it's destroying you, God knows it is. Um, the other thing, the other warning I have or concern um, is that if you are wealthy, whether or not you're conservative, you know, you can be wealthy and, you know, liberal, wealthy and moderate, wealthy and, you know, conservative, the other thing that's going to happen is, is if it hasn't happened yet, you're going to really, really want a butler, OK? <laughs> uh, it's true. You know, it has that kind of insidious influence. You wake up one day going, I need a butler. <laughs> you know, your, the, your husbands of, you know, or the men in the family are going, oh, I'm not going to put this on all by myself. <laughs> Jeez Louise, this is, you know. Um, Downton Abbey mania is everywhere, and I mean it everywhere. 250 countries are watching Downton Abbey. Um, and until I began prepping this talk, I had no idea how, you know, Downton Abbey mania, all the commercial tie-ins. Out on the street, sales of long gloves, 
Pearl's Empire Waste have soared since Downton Abbey aired. And you know, now that we're in the 20s, just you should see all the 20s stuff that's being shown. Uh, the popularity of Downton Abbey and its beautiful costumes have you know, created a whole new demand for fashions and accessories dating from 1900 again, right through the 20s. Um, there add, but that, there's more. There's more, folks. There are online quizzes to help you determine which character you'd be, um, which job you'd have. Would I be the butler, or would I be you know, the lady of the estate, or would I be the cook, or would I be the nurse? Uh, even which couple you identify with. So you and your, your honey can actually sit down and decide whether you're Anna and Bates, or you know, one of the other couples. Um, and is, if that isn't enough, we also have screening parties everywhere. And impressive to note, Vermonters, the second largest screening party in the nation wow. is right here, right here. And it is right here in Essex, actually. Um, and it's huge and it's awesome. This is a photograph from the beginning. I, I was there. I actually talked about costumes of Elton Abbey for that and got to be the costume judge because everybody just comes in fabulous apparel and sips champagne. And it was really, really quite the event. And I did because I knew I'd be doing this talk. I, I checked with PBS to ask them if they'd be doing it this year. And instead of doing it in January, which everybody really wants to go out dressed up in January, in the cold, it's going to be March 6th. With, so instead of doing it for the opening, they're doing it for the closing. But I am saying it, it was really quite the thing, quite the event, uh, social event of the season kind of thing. Um, there's also Downton Abbey tea. So many tea drinkers here, you can just feel like you're there with the Downton Estate blend. Um, there are commercial tie-ins that include jewelry, dress patterns, and even quilting fabrics. I mean, there's Downton Abbey, Downton Abbey cookbooks, Downton Abbey this. It's like anything they can pin the name to. Um, they have inspired any number of contemporary fashion designers. So there's a lot of the influence of this series in contemporary design, but with no one more so than Ralph Lauren, who does a big promo on, on each episode. Uh, and this is some more of his work. Here. The costumes are so admired that I'm going to just eliminate one of the questions I always get that I like answering, so on me. Um, they're so admired that there is now an official touring exhibit. So there always is a question about what happens to the costumes. This is what happens to the costumes. They go off on a tour called Dressing Downton. And the, believe it or not, the exhibit is just about to leave Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is, again, the fashion haven of the United States. <laughs> I understand thoroughly why they chose that. And then it's moving around. I don't know why, but it's not going to make it to Vermont. I think the next stop is in, Ver, is in Ver, uh, Richmond, Virginia in January. And again, if you need an excuse not to be in Vermont in January, there is one for you. Uh, but it, from what I've seen of the photos of this exhibit, it sounds awesome. I mean, it just looks like it's very complete, very comprehensive, and includes quotes of the characters, historical references, photographs of the cast, uh, and I think about 60 of the costumes that were made for the show. Um, oh, wait. But I, I went ahead. OK, but to me, the, ulti the ultimate thing that you know it has made it, right? You know you've made it when you've got, wait, where is that? Yeah, when they do a Muppet of you. This is the Violet Muppet. I mean, I love it so much. Yeah, I, yeah, I would love to have a Muppet of me. Um, although I think I'm already a Muppet, so that may, may be kind of overkill here. Um, why all the fuss? Why, why is there, why is Downton Abbey so popular? And we're going to sit here, class, until someone raises their hand. All right? I got a lot of patience. I'll be here all night. OK? Nobody. Nobody knows why it's popular. Yes, miss. It's romantic. It's romantic. Anything else? Thank you. That's a great yeah, hand way back there. It's, it's an escape out of, it's so completely different from the life that we all lead, that it's just an escape to somewhere else, some, another time. Yeah, I love that. That's a, also, yes, arm. People love tradition. Oh, people <laughs> love tradition. So romantic tradition escape. 
Yes. The costume. Yes. And the, the costume. costume. Yes, the most important answer of all. Uh, <laughs> but I think that, thank you, people who raised it. You will all get A's. The rest of these guys, <laughs> you don't even want to know what the report card is. But, uh, but yes, it, it is, I think it's a wonderful escape. And it's also, what's great is it's a romantic melodrama. It's really a melodrama, but it's on pity us. So I watch it on pity us. So it must be good for me. Yeah, there is that pretense of I am doing something good for me because it's on PBS and it's British. And we love, <laughs> we're Americans, we love that British accent. It's like, oh, yes, I'll do anything for you if you say it in British accent. Um, so there are all these factors. And I know at the time it came out, it was, there was Downton Abbey. It, it felt like there was Downton Abbey and then there were all these bad reality TV shows. And, you know, the little girl who you know, who had the mother that's called June. I mean, there was just all this really gross, bad reality TV. And so I think it, it is. It's a welcome relief, and it's so beautifully done. I just re-watched a couple of the first episodes in the first year, because I knew I was doing this, and I wanted to kind of have that perspective. And my God, in the first year, they were like, Rrr! and it was so fast, and Violet was like ready to bite off heads. I mean, she was like, Rrr! and so what's happened is that over the, the, we're now about to enter the sixth season, is they've all, they've developed three-dimensionality, and in that, they're less, um, less easy to type and, and hate or love, but uh, it's good stuff. Um, they're so well-designed, though, that it can really be shocking to find out that these aren't real people. And I kid you not, when I started pulling images for this talk, and I saw, I saw this one here, I went, who are these people? And oh, put some clothes on. I mean, you slutty, slutty ladies. They just look, they look, they look bad. I mean, and that heavy makeup, don't they? I mean, it's so improper. And, and then I went, wait, they aren't really people in Downton Abbey. These are the actual actors. But it does take one aback. I know you're now concerned that I really have any brain cells at all. But uh, this one is the one I find most striking. And, and Phyllis Logan, there, you know, there was tons of interviews on everybody, but Phyllis Logan will be interviewed, and they'll say, oh, uh, what, I love your makeup. What is your makeup process? And she'll say, well, you know, they put pancake all over my face, and then they, like, do white on my lips, and I'm done, you know? Um, and when you see this, you can see that they have really brought her down. Um, this is a recent cover shoot from Bazaar Magazine, again, they don't look like they do in Downton Abbey. Same, all these ladies. And I love seeing, I forget the actress's name, but I love seeing the cook like that. It's just beautiful. Yeah, I tell you, we all clean up well. Um, the primary way the series charts the passage of time is through fashion. So if you look at, you know, and this is an example. These are three dresses from the exhibit. And I think the one on the far left is something that we've seen Violet wear. But it, this really takes you, because Violet was dated. So even though the series started in 1912, this is much more emblematic of, say, 1909. But she would be wearing something that wasn't trending at the time. And this really brings us right through the early 20s, about 1922, when we're, we're going to be in 1925 in the sixth series, and we're going to have shorter things. Again, we all, as Americans, think of the 20s as so short, but genuinely, it's knee length. It's not that short from what we call short. It was just short historically in terms of that perspective. Um, you know, without the clothes, we wouldn't really know the passage of time because High Claire is stagnant. Right? It is what it is. And the furnishings still look very Edwardian. I mean, it's not like they've suddenly gone Art Nouveau, Art Deco on us. It still looks pretty darn Edwardian. Um, so the clothes are very important in indicating that, with the exception of, say, the car has helped. And then we have the toaster. Love the toaster <laughs> episode. Yeah. Um, I love the, some of the best moments are with, with um, her and, and the, um, the butler talking about the toaster, the telephone, ooh, devil's thing, or whatever you call that. Um, we, if you look at this image, this gives you a sense. Uh, according to Julian Fellows, the creator of the series, um, what is her name uh, I wanted to talk about? 
Uh, Violet was born in 1842, so that if you look at this, my friends in costume over there are just going, yeah, we know this stuff. We have all the costume folks from the Lyric Theater are over there, united, yes. Um, and they'll be selling tickets in the lobby after the, this talk. But, yeah, White Christmas. Um, but anyway, from 18, so she was born in 1848. No, what was I going to say? Yeah, 1842. So right in here, she was a baby. She consciously certainly remembered this stuff. So this is her growing up, looking, look at all the fabric and all the clothes. And then suddenly, you know, whoa! The, I think she's controlled herself very nicely when you think of the amount of fabric and, and garment that women have worn throughout her lifetime now that her, her, you know, her granddaughters are showing uh, some skin. The, the fact that she's not coming out with a machete and just chopping their heads off is, is pretty good. Um, each series has had multiple directors. Oh, this, oh, I also wanted to show this in terms of passage of time. We started off in 1912 with this kind of undergarment, but you'll notice that if you look at season one, Violet was really wearing this. You can or cannot. That's about, I think that's as big as I can, oh wait, yeah, I lied. How's that? So if you notice this S curve here, this is probably, I think that's the corset that Violet was wearing in uh, season one. And so these undergarments, but we started the show in, you know, in 1912, it's taken us all the way through there, but can you see how much less constricting things have become? And now we, they're wearing this, which is pretty, like, almost nothing. It's awesome. And so there are, you know, the actresses hated wearing their corsets. Actresses always hate wearing corsets, but it's critical to their posture, their stance, their carriage, and they know that. Uh, now, there's only two actresses wearing corsets, and so the others are like doing little dances. And the two that still are are Violet and Mrs. Hughes, and that makes great sense because they would not be taking on the latest fashions. Um, this again shows you what, what we've witnessed from 1921. That's a 20s hem, ladies, so that if you know that 20s, it depends where in the 20s. So 1921 is really ankle length. Uh, and 1925, that's about as daring as it gets. So, but again, pretty darn daring if they've been floor length all your life. Uh, this is the actress who plays Edith. Edith, although I call her poor Edith. Um, <laughs> and she, you know, she will talk about the fact, um, or she's here with uh, Gareth Neum, who's one of the pr executive producers on the show, and to quote, the costume designer is really part of the producing team because she has a huge amount to do with the telling of the story. For those of us who have been costume designers, it's like, they never say that about us. They, they're always like, yeah, yeah, costumes. So this is huge. It's huge that Downton Abbey actually gets the significance of their costume designers. Uh, each series has multiple directors and cinematographers, and they, because of location work, they sometimes will shoot two or three scenes simultaneously. Uh, so different directors might be involved on the same episode, right? Um, but, and that adds to the feeling of freshness, I think, and energy of the show. Anyone, can anyone tell me how many directors have been involved in the, in the, in the series? Twelve. So there have been twelve different directors, um, but there is a lead director for each season who kind of controls the other directors and is controlled by the consistent presence of Liz Truebridge. And Liz Truebridge, and these are just some more shots of the show, is shown here in the white, a hugely important person. I think she and Alistair Bruce, who is their historical advisor, have everything to do with the consistent quality and, cons you know, and, and consistency of the show. Um, to date, there have been three costume designers. Uh, the first is Susanna Buxton, who did series one and two. Then we had Carolyn McCall, series three and four. And finally, we have Anna Scott, series five and six. And what I'll do during the rest of my talk, when I'm depending, I'm trying to mi I mix it up with different series, seasons. So it's not all season five. It, I reference different ones to give you a varied experience. Do you know that I'll just use their last names. And um, did any, had anyone noticed there was a change in designer? 
Yeah, it's, and, and that's good. It's been pretty smooth. I did think that this last series, um, I found series five to be a little bit more fancier. It didn't feel as real to me consistently. But I think it was pretty close. Um, and I did, for those of you who have worked in theater, ladies from the Lyric, um, I worked. I searched long and hard to find out why. Like, was there was to get whatever dirt there was on why this had happened. And I think they probably just burned out because I couldn't find any. Um, I couldn't find any gossip about what had happened with these ladies. Again, it's a lot of costumes to do. Um, they have just four weeks of prep before shooting begins, which is enough time to get the costumes together for the first two episodes. Um, and this is a quote, while consuming a lot of candy and gossip. Um, and there's a 12-person 12 12 costume crew. The budget is 31 to 41,000 per episode, which is a little more, that isn't the budget you have? No? No, come on. Um, which sounds like a ton of money. But when you consider the number of actors and the costumes and the, you know, the writing and the hunting and the evening wear and did 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 did, and the fact that um, Lord Grantham's suit alone cost 4200 as his dinner jacket here. And I'm sure he's on dinner jacket number three by now. Um, Scott follows the same creative uh, process and working practice that was begun by Buxton. Inspiration comes from all kinds of sources and what they what they do is the same thing I, I do as a theater costumer and they use a lot of, of vintage magazines, antique photographs, they troll the, um, the vintage and antique markets for lace and trims and things so that they will use those as accent pieces or insets in a garment that they're making to give it a little bit of of integrity and historical accuracy. So these are some of the tear sheet boards that they do. Um, the, I, I have this photograph here because I wanted to remember to tell you that Queen Alexandra of Denmark served as the original inspiration back in episode one for Violet's costumes. She was a contemporary of Violet's and a mother to King George V. So we, we know that Violet would have gone, got a suit, and, and she was a fashionista. So Violet would definitely have kept an eye on what she was wearing. What Violet didn't know is, you know, and Vi so Violet immediately saw that Alexandra was wearing these high necks and brooches and said, got to do that, got to be fabulous, high necks and brooches. She didn't know the reason Alexandra was doing the high necks and brooches was because she'd had a scar from a childhood incident. It wasn't because she thought it looked all that great. And, and if, you know, people who know the history of Western dress know that. You know, men cut their hair short during the Renaissance. Why? because the king of France got a burning cinder on his head. You know, people had wide shoes in the Renaissance because, the, you know, someone else had six toes. People, I mean, we have throughout the history of fashion done some crazy stuff just because the royals did it because of some one of those wonderful deformities they all had from inbreeding. Um, so don't get me started, right? Um, so when, again, uh, during the costume prep period, here we show Violet, again, mimicking Alexandra. Uh, during the costume prep period, uh, Scott works from offices at Cosprop, which is the second biggest costume house in London. And also, so they, they do a lot of pulling and renting here, um, and also at Ealing Studios, which is the largest, uh, the oldest continuously operating studio in the world, film studio. So this, though, uh, Cosprop is where a lot of, most of the maids and the butlers and the men are built here because tailors do that. So costume people do, it's like I have my own section, yeah, catch them, we know. Uh, costume people do ladies' clothing, but tailoring is an art unto itself, a very specific kind of art that requires specific skills, so the men's wear is separate from that. Um, I am talking, focusing my talk on ladies' clothing because we're still at a time historically where the men are really serving as a backdrop to the ladies. In, in England, for sure, it's not until you know, the 60s, the Peacock Revolution, that men are anything other than just you know, very, yeah. And um, so, so why talk about them, all right? <laughs> really, I mean, hello. Uh, this is Ealing Studios, again, where they have a workroom focused on the ladies' clothing and that shows you another view of it. 
Uh, this is, so there we have the men. We're giving a nod to the men, and these were some great clothes. Again, the men's stuff, though, all the beautiful work for the, the servants. This is Cutter Sarah Humphrey, who has to be just a totally exhausted lady by now. But she has been doing much of the patterning and overseeing the stitching for the production of the women's clothes in Downton Abbey. Um, and that's a typical of this is the workroom table, sewing some of the gorgeous fabrics that they're being used. And here we have, I don't think, this must be a volunteer from the community who's in the workroom on this one. Um, this is the costume designer. Here is the costume designer for the third Scott. Her name's Anna Scott. This, um, anybody know her name? Yeah, OK. Katie. Katie, yes. I, this is a tabloid lecture. Woo, right? Uh, the scenes are, in terms of the design of the clothes, it's, it's not unlike what we do in theater, although uh, we work with a set and lighting designer so that there is a totality to the look, so that we don't do costumes in one palette and the set's a different palette and you come and go, oh my God, were they drinking that heavily while they worked on this show? Um, the difference in film is that usually the art director has uh, a greater status than the costume designer and has already determined the look of the rooms and we work with that. And particularly, you know, in a place like Highclere, which is pretending to be Downton Abbey, you know, if I said, well, I really want them all to wear this, and so the wall should be that, ain't going to go over real well. So they're working with, and this again shows you what the total picture might be like. Um, and this is one of the rooms in Highclere that I think we've all seen a lot in. But, but again, what changes it is the presence of the costumes and also the change in lighting. So this is the green room. Now look at it. With, you know, again, um, and here we have it at night. Completely different ambiance and, and you know, palette that might be needed. Uh, this is a, the green room. Again, this is one of my favorite outfits from, I think this was season one, and Sybil in the, the boss harem outfit. But you'll notice, again, costume designers, we have to be conscious of this. Mama, we lose Mama. Like, where's Cora? Where are you? Because she's wearing too much ivory in a, in a room that has ivory wainscoting. Is that what we call that? Uh, again, this is another example of that. See how the men are just shadows there to show off the ladies. Uh, but the ladies, two out of three of them, are lost in the, on the Iacru sofa. So bad, bad, bad. Uh, this is, again, a great, here we see a shot inside High Claire, but look at it with the characters dressed in costume. It's yummy. Uh, this is a, a, a shot from season one, and I like to include this in my presentation because it really shows you, um, it, it, in one shot, you get to see three different, um, the three different ways clothing is, is found or made for the show. Uh, here we have Sybil in a, a vintage piece that was found in an antique shop. Mary is wearing something that was completely made from you know, scratch because she is, she's huge. I mean, she's a tall girl, sort of model size. And so everything she wears is made. Nothing she wears is, is pulled or rented or thrifted. And then we have poor Edith wearing something, you know, like from the, from the, from the rental rack. It was like, oh yeah, there. Give me that. Pick it up off the floor, shake off the dust, and put it on Edith. And that was, that's sort of how we're dressing her, were, until she, she fell in love, right? Um, this is one of the only authentic pieces that was used. And um, this little outfit that was foreign, because again, the clothes are so tiny. I have, my friends are going to love this, I've always often said, and again, organic Vermonti people know that I'm joking, um, but it is, I've often said, when I've you know, gone through my historical collection at the college, it's, if only women, you know, you find out you're pregnant, could you start chain smoking and drinking heavily? <laughs> because your babies, every women, all the women are practicing such good prenatal care that the babies are like this big. And they don't fit in my period clothes. And there is something wrong with that. So if everyone, you know, if you have, you know, whatever you have, daughters, granddaughters, yourself, you know, think of us, OK? <laughs> Try to, I mean, don't be so selfish. So she's tiny. She fit into that. But that's one of the rare uh, reasons. Can anyone tell me other reasons why, why? So why can't they use original clothing? I just pointed out one, which is people are so damn big now. What else? It disintegrates. The fabrics, right? Yeah, the fabrics are very delicate. And they're faded. And they're faded. Yeah, how many things? Hello? 
with the shoulder fading. Okay, anything else? Flammable. Well, that's, no, that's true too. That's true too. Um, but the other main reason is that they don't exist. And, and this is something I think the quilters might appreciate that, and especially those of us who have, who have become more conscious about our footprint that we're leaving behind. And that is what they did then. If you remember that image I showed you with all the, the you know, history of fashion, the different silhouettes. And you'll notice how the silhouettes kept getting smaller and smaller. What they did throughout the history of fashion, if you had an awesome gown or something, or a suit, and new, new fashions came in 30 years later, you would have that recut. If you couldn't recut it or you weren't of a class that you did your own sewing, you would have your ladies, whatever, recut it and make it into something else. And then it would get in your will, in your will, it would go to your daughter or a niece or someone, and then the styles would change and she would have it recut. And that's why it's so convenient that things kept getting smaller in scale, because it kept getting recut. By the time we're in the 20s, there's no going back, you know. But, um, but there was this real um, respect for workmanship for, for the textile. And now we are in such a throwaway society that we don't do that. But that is part of why, really, only a few of the things that still exist were things that were really worn. Because things got wore out or else they got recut. So it's really it's important to note that many of the things that still exist from the 18th or 19th or early 20th century are things nobody liked. Like, you know, oh, I'm not wearing that. Thanks, Aunt Mildred. And, you know, and it's just this dog awful fabric. And there is a reason that's in the historical collection because it's still ugly. Um, OK. I, you, it's a good thing I'm not opinionated, don't you think? Yeah. Um, so bits and pieces, what they do is they find bits and pieces of antique fabrics in various, you know, they travel to Istanbul, to the flea market, and I'm going, I'm lucky if I make it to Burlington, right? But uh, they have the budget to go to various places and look and find these antique pieces that are just stunning. They'll, re, um, they'll put them on a sturdier fabric, rebead them, um, and be able to do some wonderful accent work on different garments. So for example, this is a very common technique, particularly in seasons uh, three and four. So everybody go back, watch those seasons. But you'll see that the inset pieces, the bodices particularly, have some wonderful, very interesting fabric. And then the rest of the dress is, is you know, a contemporary fabric that has been carefully handled. That's true of that. That's true of this with Cora. Um, Cora. This is, again, the current designer, Anna Marie Scott Robbins, who had, has actually been interviewed, as were the others, about her concept for the different characters. Uh, and her concept for um, Cora is that she's an exotic beginning in a Yorkshire estate. And if you go back and look at some of the choices, not all, but some of the choices for Cora, there is a little bit of a flair there. And she is the one who's most likely to wear something that has a Japanese or Chinese influence, um, which has been fashionable since forever, I think, among Westerners. Uh, Sybil, again, was, was considered the innocent of the three in the cast and tended to wear you know, pale pinks, pale blues, uh, Sybil, I mean, sorry, um, Edith, poor Edith, would tend to wear oranges, browns, some greens. And here we have all three. Mary would more likely be in the red, black, something strong, deep blue. Uh, and they each had their own. Initially, the first year, they each had their own color concept. But what happened as they trusted that we have clues, you know, we, we figure out, oh, that's Edith now. Um, we'd learn the characters enough that they could dress them in similar palette, and we'd still be able to tell them apart because we're sharper than they think, even though we're American. Um, and so, you know, here, I think this is by the end of season one, we have them all basically in the same color. But what I love is that even though they're in the same color, there is our distinctions within each dress that lend itself. I mean, I think Mary's dress is much more formal, more, pro you know, proper. Uh, and Sybil certainly is more dynamic and has more energy, more interest, and Edith as well, Edith. Uh, here we have Mary, again, wearing the red, 
the black, that whole year of her being in mourning. Uh, again, we're, they were, it was very interesting. It wasn't until after, you know, people historically throughout the Victorian times, again, Victoria 1837 to 1901, when her, I think Prince Albert died in maybe the 1840s, 50, uh, from that moment on, she wore black. And so there was this whole thing in England and the United States about wearing black. If you were, had any claim to being of, of class, you wore black. If someone died and there were rules, you know, you had first mourning for the year, first year and a month or something, and you'd had to wear black, and then you wore a different black, and then you wore kind of a purpley plum color, and it went on. So a woman, if your husband died, you could be in black for two and a half years. If your wife died, you wear an armband for a month. Okay, that's all I'm saying. So it's very interesting uh, how even in the very first episode, which I just rewatched, there was this whole thing about the, the cousin who dies on the Titanic, and Mary's like, oh, do I wear black? And they're all, but what happened is, so that was the rule, that was the protocol, uh, until World War I. With World War I, there was so much death that that rule just, it was it. Because everyone would have been burned, were black for years. There was so much loss of life with that. Uh, but Mary, again, now this past season, she's been much more cutting edge. Loved this in the fashion show. Loved the fashion show. Um, that was just wonderful. And again, wore the dark reds, the dark blues. This, I love this outfit. It's very striking outfit. And again, you'll see that it's, I think it's a contemporary uh, they, you know, ivory satin, but they found this brilliant beaded piece, although I think this may have been one that they actually had hand beaded. Uh, she's also, again, in her connection to the estate, you will see her wearing more and more of the tweeds, which, again, are so indigenous to our perception of the Brit British countryside. Um, on to uh, poor Edith. Edith, uh, again, was originally in much more of these kind of orange green thing. And what I love, though, is once she begins to work in London, her, her look really comes to life. And she's dressed so much better. Love this. Uh, so strong. It's so strong. Um, and there she is again. Uh, I love talking about this dress because there's a wonderful story behind it. And it really exemplifies the costume making um, art that is used on the series. And so, you know, take a look at this dress. And what, again, George Barbet, does anyone who knows French? Bar, B A R B I E R. George, George Barbet? Barbier. Barbier. George Barbier, an artist of this time. Um, so the, the, the costume for her for this scene, that's when she meets him at the restaurant to begin the, oh la la, um, was based on his, George. Barbier's art. And so here's the research that, that we saw. Uh, and the costume designer was in Paris and found this little you know, piece about this big that was beaded, this beautiful green beaded piece. And I, it, you know, many times it is a dress that the, you know, has the dry rod or the age stain here, but can be recut. And so she bought that and brought it to the shop, had that recut, again, using a different fabric for the surround. And that is what we see right here. And the costume shop called that dress Beadeth, which I get it, Beadeth, Beads and Edith. Anyway, love that. Um, this, the, the newest member of the cast uh, has really supplanted the, I don't know why that's doing that, has really taken the part of Sybil in, in the palette. And so she, even though I don't think she's particularly innocent, she at times is naive, related to relationships anyway. And so she tends to um, be wearing the pinks and, and pale blues. Uh, this is a suit that was made in the shop. I'm not particularly a fan of it, but it does show. To me, this really shows the modernness. It shows the contemporary. It doesn't blend like some of the other things. Uh, this is stunning. And this actually is an authentic uh, dress from, I think they took the sleeves off, but it's an authentic dress from the early 20s that was a wedding dress. And, and the costume staff decided that it had never been used. 
And so they, they, they were really excited about using it and thought of it, uh, you know, that perhaps the woman who was planning to wear it, her husband and her prospective husband died in the war, as so many men did. And so, you know, they called this the second chance dress. Um, oh, I know, it's so sweet. Uh, the, the wedding dresses I really like to talk about, too, because they, um, what did I want to say? There was a, Mary was so tough and so kind of mean throughout the first and second episode that once we get to the point where she's going to get married, the designer wanted to soften her look. And at the time, in terms of, uh, I think this is, you know, 19, probably about 1918, wouldn't it be 1918, 1919, they wanted something to soften. And they, the fashionable choices for that period would have been satin or lace. And she didn't want to use satin, but she wanted, you know, satin has a little sheen to it, wanted some sheen versus a flat lace. So, of course, just like we costume people do, she called Svorsky and said, hello, I need some, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I think, how many do I, I have it written down here, uh, anyway, don't, a million zillion, that's how many, Svors, Swork, Swarovski, that's, Swarovski crystals were hand sewn onto that dress. Uh, she is wearing a diamond tiara. So now that you see it there, see if you can spot it on her head. She's wearing an 1830s diamond tiara uh, that was rented from Bentley and Skinner. The frame was altered so it could be worn on the head differently. Uh, valued at 205,000 pounds, which is more than dollars, okay? It had its very own set costumer. It had its very own person on set who was just like watching it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, can anyone tell me when it was used a second time? <laughs> this is such an easy question. Good. I love that little hand back there. It was Edith's aborted wedding. Yes. Wow. Okay, you get an A plus and a car. Um, yeah, it was, you know, huh? No, no. Uh, but anyway, yes, because I uh, apparently I didn't realize I was talking to peasants. <laughs> really? Oh, really? We opened this up to the peasants? No, because any family, any proper family like the Crawleys, of course, had the family tiara. So, so your, your inability to get that question right infers that you guys don't have family tiaras? <laughs> oh, oh, we better hose down this room after y'all leave, I tell you. Um, no, would be worn by generations of Crawley brides. All those saying Crawley brides, just look at these brides that crawl. <laughs> right, unfortunate choice of name. Uh, there were two considerations in Edith's wedding dress. So here she is wearing the tiara. Uh, one was that she had to look stunningly beautiful as a bride. The other one was more unique. She had to look equally lovely as she hurled her body onto the bed crying and sobbing. And, uh, and that's not usually when I've been asked to design a wedding dress, they don't just say, and I want it to look really good when I scream and, you know, slice myself because he's going to walk out on me. Um, but I, I thought that was interesting. I also loved, and she had to have satin because Mary had the lace, you know. Um, but I loved that, my, one of my favorite moments in the, all the, the series were that veil kind of going down that balcony like that. It's just beautiful. Um, during seasons three and four, I also reveled in this relationship. Yeah, I mean, what an, as costume design as a costume designer, much of what I do is help articulate that character, help you understand, so that you see what the character is saying, so that I know all this backstory stuff. I don't want to give the story away about who this person is before you learn it. I don't want it to be like you instantly know this is a prostitute. But I I do. Unless I only have a minute, then you, like the red comes out. But I do think that you you want contrasting characters is so important and it's so much fun. And this, you know, this is especially because they're in the same palette, so you're not using color. You're only using texture and line and form. I mean, this is so so great. Um, unlike Violet, the again Le Mrs. Levinson's costumes just illustrate her eagerness to say, I'm fabulous, and you are losers, and you are English, going down. It's our century. Um, but I, I just love seeing the two of them together. I want to talk about the actual filming process now. All of the below-stairs scenes, 
So all the kitchen, the servants' rooms, the uh, Mrs. Hughes, and I'm spacing on his name, the butler. Carson's little offices, that's all shot at Ealing Studios. Why? Why isn't that shot at High Clare? Light. What? Light. Lighting. Well, no, it's actually not light. It's because. But it's currently a gift shop. Yes, yeah, currently a gift shop. Thank you so much. It's because they didn't save that. That got, you know, with the passing of decades and, the, you know, the change in the way people lived, that whole downstairs uh, world of servants and so forth is, is no more. And so they had to replicate that in the soundstage at Ealing Studios. Uh, most of the bedrooms, they started off using all the bedrooms and the great hall and the, you know, the, the library and all that. Um, and what they have done, I think Cora's bedroom is now at Ealing Studios too, mainly because rooms that they're using a lot, it's just hard to get the sound and the light and all that in, this, in an actual bedroom. And so it's easier to replicate it. Um, but so that is, is what's different. Until last season, all, uh, any scenes that were in Edith's bedroom were shot at High Clare. As of this past season, that has changed. Does anyone venture a guess why? Set it on fire. Yeah, kind of hard. You know, I think the owners of High Clare would be a little unhappy yeah. if you burn down their estate. So, yeah, I, this is actually what it looks like when the filming for Downton Abbey is, is happening. So not quite as pretty looking. All the they can't, you know, they're not allowed to eat, drink, smoke, hang out in there. So that the the vans, the um, trailers become, you know, the home for for most everybody. Uh, and I want to show you this just because I found it amusing. So this is Edith as we saw her reading the book that has Gregson's uh, signature. Uh, and this is hard, probably hard to see, and how dark it is. But that's the fire starting. She's in bed. You, you really can't see that, can you? Um, and that's him carrying her out, I think. Them throwing the water on. This is what actually, this is what's there. This is what actually, when during the filming, this is, yeah. So this is when you do film, this is what happens, is you no longer can look at film and not think of the, all these cameras. So this is what it really was like. And this was the fire here. Um, so they did build the set, though. I just love her lying there and the guy with the thing going, psh. Um, they did build a set at Ealing Studios that they could do the mock fire in. Uh, again, you see the trailers outside High Clare. So each actor, each of the member, each member of the ensemble that you see their names on the screen uh, has their own, like very modestly sized trailer. The, the makeup and hair people have a trailer that when they, they're called, they're usually called at least two hours before they appear on camera so that they can get hair, makeup, costume, eat some breakfast. Uh, this is the wardrobe trailer. So this is where all the costumes are housed. And then the, the first people there, first to come and last to go, wardrobe. Uh, and so you will see, if you look over here, the name of some of the actors. And I think that's here. We have Thomas, Jimmy, Clarkson. And these are their, their um, continuity sheets. So these are photographs of the preceding scene where they're wearing that so that the next time we see them, it will match how the collar is done. Again, with servants wear, it's pretty basic. But when you're dealing with things that are more liquid, that are more fluid as garments, it becomes much more challenging. Uh, this, again, is another volunteer working on costumes. Just, I tell you, when you're the princess in England, there's no limit to what you help on. Um, and again, another shot of the trailer. And this is one that I particularly like, because in addition to having all the costumes, they have other things that we, our eyes don't see when we watch the series, but they are present. Anybody, can anybody read or guess what's in these two bins here? Collars? Uh, no. No. Nope. Underwear, no. But these are all very good guesses. You guys will get a passing grade. Um, but no, actually, there are silk thermals in those two bins. Now, I don't know about you, but I have not seen an episode where silk thermals are revealed, um, nor have I seen an episode where they're all wearing what they like to call puffy coats. And uh, here is another one. So this is, you know, obviously a, a very accurate period puffy coat scene. Uh, I love these. And this one particularly, the banana is not in the palette, Anna. Uh, 
And here we have the girls waiting for their hair, yeah, with the hair to be done. Um, apparently, and this is actually a quote, um, yeah, where is that? According to producer Liz Truebridge, uh, it has its own microclimate. Even on a hot day, it's cold. On a cold day, it's freezing. Yeah, and so everybody is dying of the cold, and they can't hang out in the house because that's not allowed because it is a very valuable uh, estate. So when they're waiting, especially when they're doing exterior scenes, they between takes, it's puffy coats, it's hot water bottles, it's what you learn to do on, on set where you just rub their shoulders. Um, this is, I, I, I didn't know about the puffy coats until I had already seen uh, the weddings, but this is Sybil's wedding, and you see how, how lightly attired the girls are. It's spring, it's summer. I remember seeing that in the village. I think the villagers are also like, la, like near and sunny. And it was, I mean, they were back there with the hot water bottles. This is, um, yeah, look at them. They're on their way to the wedding, but they are so cold. There's Cora. Yeah, full on wedding, but puffy coat. They could start a trend. Uh, Jim Carson, uh, for anyone who's, has any, who's worked on film here? Anybody else besides? Uh, it is, it sounds so glamorous, and we would say, where's the glamour? It is hard work, and it's a lot of waiting around. And so he's quoted as saying, filming is a bit like life in service. There's a lot of waiting, and then moments of frenetic activity. Uh, he spends his time, just FYI, he's the president of his cricket club. So he spends a lot of time organizing cricket matches. Uh, this is a daily call sheet that is used, and there's probably two or three of these again because they, they can shoot at the same time at High Clare as they're shooting at Ealing. And so this is, these are the names of the actors, the characters they play, what time they're called where. Uh, and again, it's the first thing you get at the end of the day, it's usually would be, nowadays it would be emailed or texted to you because this is the kind of thing that changes daily. So the costume people may have things ready for the shoot that's going to be blah, 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 but they may suddenly change that because of, it's always based on location, it's the priority. Talent is what actors are called, not us. Um, but, and it's based on that. So the costumes, oftentimes you have to kind of think fast. They, uh, this is one that I, again, have already shown you, but Again, wonderful example of that costume with the research. And the reason I show it here is because wardrobe. So that if you're doing a film, there is constantly the need, particularly when you're using antique fabrics or garments, is to constantly have to do retouches. This was a famous garment for that. Every time they yelled cut, they did. I mean, they ran, got her, sat her, and restitched something because it kept falling apart during the filming. Um, and here we have, uh, I think this is Carolyn McCall with Maggie doing a minor repair. Uh, apparently with the beaded dresses, the, the, which are so indigenous to the 20s, the latest is that they'll say, um, take blah, 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 action. And the wardrobe crew is just there listening to see if you hear the sounds of beads falling, which is a very bad sound. Very bad sound. Um, the uh, again, the stiff collars. I think uh, the again, the men hate them. Uh, Hugh Bonneville. Stiff collars are a pain in the neck. Quite literally, get it? I'd put in the get it. Uh, but they affect your bearing and make you stand up. So I, I've used these in theater a lot, and let me tell you, it's kind of like corseting a man's neck. So uh, they're again the historically appropriate costumes really give us a sense of accurate period accuracy, but they are uncomfortable. Um, the ladies unanimously despise their corsets. And be, beyond the, the uh, character costs, so we know we have the costumes we see, right? We know we have the puffy coats, the silk thermals, the undergarments, all that stuff. What else is in the wardrobe trailers? Nice. Except all those lots of accessories, lots of accessories, lots of jewelry, but there's also doubles. So doubles are again not something we really do much in theater because in theater we, we do plays the way God meant from the beginning to the end, right? But in in film, they, it's just like the golden rule of film that they have to shoot the grimy, dirty scene first, and then they shoot the pure 
clean version. So you need multiples of anything that's going to get kind of dingy so, and, and, and so that you can do these different takes, right? Uh, and so here we have the corset thing. So for example, this is Matthew in his uniform, and this is Matthew in his uniform. Uh, no, useful to note, and again, I've already told you what accord the producers give costumes in Downton Abbey. The, they hired a separate costume designer to do the military stuff for World War I, and she actually talked them into shooting it in, sequ shooting them it in sequence because a lot of the digging through the tunnels in that so that the actual action in the, um, in the, the war games or the war situations would not have to be shot out of context. Uh, the other reason you have doubles is because sometimes actors can't do everything they're scripted to be able to do, and Rob James Collier could not play cricket to save his life, although he was scripted to save the game. So they had to do a body double for him. Um, I have this. Uh, the other, let's see, we're not talking about the doubles. Um, the greatest continuity challenges, though, in the series really relate to location. And the fact that, that, I don't know if you know this, but this is one of the footmen carrying a tray of food. So how many times? A lot, right? We see a lot of time we see the cook putting the food and saying, now, and the footman is talking to somebody. He's like, get up there. Food's going to be cold. Take it up there, right? Very common, very common. Did you know that when she shoes him up those stairs, he goes out the door, he gets in a truck, he drives all the way to Ealing Studios, gets out of the truck, walks in. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean it's, or it's the reverse. I just said it backwards. He walks out of Ealing Studios onto the truck into the dining room because all the food is prepared, served, cooked, handed off in Ealing Studios, and the dining room is at Highclere. I mean, no wonder they had sitting there for hours eating that food because it's really cold, you know? That sauce, the banana sauce, the bidou boo, you know. Uh, but literally, that is what happens. And the actors, if they, they hated the corsets, they hate. Like, I'm sure the woman would say, I'll wear a corset every day if I don't have to do another dining room scene. Because they sit there for hours, and any time a dining room scene is shot, it has to be shot from every actor's angle. So if there are 12 people at that table, that means that's 12 times just for each moment. So you drink, take a sip, then they're going to do it. They have to refill all the glasses. If you took a bite full, the fork has to be cleaned again. The food, I mean, it is grueling to do that. Um, so that, you know, in terms of, so that's really a huge continuity issue for the food prop people. Uh, it, it's not without some issue with costumes, but it's so mild comparatively. Uh, here we have the dining room, the despised dining room. Um, and then we also, you know, it is not uncommon, again, where someone will be putting on a pair of gloves. So think of, this is Mary's bedroom, but think of Cora's bedroom, knowing that that is at Ealing Studios. We see her putting on the gloves, the jewelry. Make sure that when you see her appear in the dining room or in the library, that everything is exactly the same. Um, and you get gold stars if you find things. There. Uh, back to the trailers. And what did I want to tell you about these? Oh, the extras. So and again, and beyond all the doubles and the clothes and that, you have to have close really extras. Extras are not done like they're done in theater. And it was a rude awakening to me when I started working on film. And it was like we didn't spend all this time thinking about each individual costume. You have a rack full of stuff that's kind of right for the scene. And you say, oh, this should fit you. Put this on. And they're all the... Yeah, all that like tweaking we do for, you think of all the, yeah, any, any big musical, all those people who are the chorus, that. Um, and so here we have the, this is the, I think this was the village fair. Um, that was Mary's wedding, Buckingham Palace, the prison, the lineup, the Russian refugees, the fashion show, uh, the soldiers. They're, these people are actually in the show. I'm kidding there. Um, but that, that's a whole lot of clothing for extras. Um, do, 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 do. As Series 5 progressed, we saw characters modernize and affect the styles of the early 20s. And I don't know about you, but I am anxiously awaiting Season 6. The, the thing is, though, is, is in this age of binge watching, right, which is very common. You hear a lot about that. And having been teaching at a college, you know, I'm in, all my students are, are binge watching. 
And I, I'm a delayed gratification kind of girl. Like, you give me a present for my birthday, I will wait till it's 10 p.m. on my birthday to open it because I want to know it's there. I like the looking forward to. So I am not. Even though I think you all know, you could go to your computer tonight and watch all of season six. I'm not going to do that because I want to see how many, you know, I want to uh, rather wait. Um, but I know that I probably revved you all up. Are you guys kind of like going, oh, Downton Abbey, you want to get your Downton Abbey on? So I did want to give you a few things to kind of like help you segue from this to reality. Because it's 89 days before it starts. Yeah, the countdown clock. The countdown clock is going. Tick, tick. And I think I did, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning or later, that March 6th is going to be the big gala thing. And, um, but in the meantime, did you know that you could play Mysteries of the Manor? Yes, it's called Downton Abbey Mysteries of the Manor. If you have a smartphone, and most of us do, you can, on your Android or iPhone, download Mysteries of the Manor, Downton Abbey, colon, Mysteries of the Manor, and you too can play and find, find the treasures. Find out who stole what. Or if you're just going, I know I have a smartphone, I want to use a smartphone, I'm from Vermont, I don't do that. Well, did you know, you know, you could do this. You could smear your body. And Downton, oil of Olay, just, and it's, it's getting winter, it's going to be dry, you know, the heat really takes, my skin gets so dry in, you know, the heat, just lather it on, lather it on, and, you know, play Downton Abbey bingo, watching a, watch a rerun, you know, go to the library, every library has, has the, um, the, you know, the seasons, watch it, and again, every time someone gets a telegram, get, and then you put a little more lather on, you know, it's just, it's a great way to spend, a, you know, a cool night. Um, there are Downton Abbey costume sketches that you can color. This is a coloring book. Yeah, again, not by anybody who had anything to do with the show, just some enterprising woman whose husband is an editor. Um, and there are Downton Abbey paper dolls. So, I mean, you could get these. Your grandchildren are coming to visit, but you could say, I got it for Susie. But in the meantime, Susie's going to go, who's O'Brien? And why is she creepy? My, you know, Grammy O'Brien smokes. That's bad. Yeah. Um, there are, there's even uh, Downton Abbey playing cards, which I, I want to know who watches Downton Abbey and uses playing cards. But uh, I, don't, I don't know that, and I don't know that I need to. But my, my personal favorite of, of all of these is the O'Brien. Yes. My bangs are full of secrets, and they are. And that, that's a wrap. Thank you. Good. Any questions? Can we turn the lights on? Any questions? Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. That's so kind. Thank you. Am I still here? Testing, testing. Uh, anything else? Any questions, comments? Have you visited High Place? I have not. I have not. I probably will at some point. But I, I recently retired from Middlebury College, and I've been. I've used my costume. I've done nothing but costume design since I was, what, twenty. Nothing but costume design, and I actually have been doing interior design and, and landscaping, and I've just yeah. So I've been using other parts of my my art artistry. Anything else? Yes, hand way back there. On the slide that had men's collars, there was a device that looked like a horse. What was that? I think it helped them button the collar. Oh, it's yeah, yeah, and if there was a hook in that image, the other thing is a lot of times the shoes, shoes. They, for riding boots particularly, they needed a boot hook to put them on, and we use that all the time in, in our stuff. So um, uh, different apparatuses to, to dress. Anybody else? Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.